Now to growing concerns about the deadly coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. Chinese officials taking every precaution to contain the virus. The government does not want this infection to leave. Good afternoon. We come on the air because President Trump is about to speak on the coronavirus outbreak. For healthy people, if you're healthy, uh, you will probably uh, go through a process and, and you'll be fine. A recent report covering 80,000 youth globally, it found that symptoms of depression and anxiety doubled during the pandemic, with 25 percent of youth experiencing symptoms of depression and 20 percent experiencing symptoms of anxiety. My name is Dulce and I'm from Brooklyn. This pandemic made me realize a lot of stuff about myself and how when you go through a lot alone, you tend to be more aware of your feelings and being more um, acknowledged to your surroundings and those who like are there for you. A lot of people died during the, the pandemic and that really hit home for everyone, not just um, the clients that I serve and that my people serve, but also me and and my and my coworkers and my friends and my family. You know, the the pandemic really affected everyone. My name is Tong Tong. Uh, I'm from China. made them not want to go to the doctor, not want to go to a therapist, not want to go to counselors, not want to go um, and and get the services they, that they need. The pandemic has maybe pushed us to places that we never would have thought we'd go because of the extremes, the, the stress, the pressure of it. People are working now more than ever. People think yeah, I, people are not working at all or they're working all the time. Last year this time, I didn't really hang out with friends. I was just by myself because I didn't want to be very, very exposed to to too many people. And I felt very lonely for, for a bit. I think that the pandemic has caused so much more isolation. And really, people want to be connected. We were not meant to be disconnected. We are social creatures. We're meant to touch each other, to see each other, to interact. And when you have a pandemic where all of that is beyond our control, um, it's, it's really hard. And so sometimes when you're by yourself, you know, it can get pretty, pretty tricky with your emotions. Honestly, the pandemic really affected me, uh, like, because it started my senior year, too, and, like, it took away everything for me. Like, it took away my swim season, my senior night, my ASV, like, everything that I was, I love being with people, and I love being a part of my school, or my high school at the time, and it took everything away, and it made me, honestly, really depressed to be home all the time and always in my room. It just put me really down, honestly. So many people are struggling during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Stuff has been going on for a long time, but the pandemic has made it worse. If you're isolated and alone, substance abuse has gone up. Um, process addictions like eating disorders have gone up. Um, people are having struggling with being in a house with their families all day. Hotline calls to the National Eating Disorder Association are up to 70 to 80 percent in recent months. Eating disorders, they can affect both women and men, and now doctors are seeing more brought on during this pandemic. For me, I had an eating disorder in my sophomore year of high school, and it completely like ruined my life. And then I started to, like, every single year I'd relapse, like junior year I'd relapse, senior year I'd relapse, and finally I thought I was at a place where I could, you know, do better. I was going to the gym. I, like, loved being, like, strong and healthy instead of, like, being just skinny and everything. Thing. And then the pandemic hit and gyms closed and I, you know, like Gabby said, everything senior year got taken away from me. And I honestly, like laying at home all day, I didn't have an urge to do anything just at all. It felt like every day was the same. And then I couldn't work out. So in my mind, I was like, well, if I couldn't work out, like I don't even have to eat. I don't have to feel my body anymore. So then I relapsed 
for like the third year in a row and that was really hard again because I thought like I was finally over it and I realized how easy it was for just like to get sent back into that time. Facts. Anorexia nervosa, binge eating disorder, and eating disorders not otherwise specified, ED, NOS, are very real and very serious mental illnesses. This eating disorder that I had was caused by a very heavy breakup, and I just completely stopped eating. I didn't know how to treat myself good. I stopped taking care of myself and you know my family and I just went like zero mode on everybody I just didn't talk to no one there were so many things in my life around 12 13 14 that I did not have control over because I was you know in a situation with my family where I really wasn't allowed that permission for self-discovery not to mention just peer-to-peer -peer relationships when you're in junior high school are just very weird and difficult. And so what I tried to do was find something that I could control. So, okay, I can't control any of that. What I can control is how much food I'm taking in. What I can control is my ability to exercise. And so what I did was I went into overdrive and realized that I was trying to control my food, my exercise, because I thought that that was help actually helping me control certain areas of my life. Eating disorders have the second highest mortality rate of any psychiatric diagnosis outranked only by opioid use disorder. First of all, I didn't even know that was true. Like, that's insane. I did not, I thought it would be more like depression and maybe like other type of stuff, but I didn't think the eating disorder would actually kill more people than any other type of stuff. Why don't you think people are talking about it? It's like, it's a really big issue that affects people on a daily basis. Probably, so. Probably because there's so much else going on. Getting validated by the medical community people, I mean, on television all the time, weight loss, weight loss. Um, these couch now diets that they have like noon. Oh, we're using a CBT method to help you lose weight. No, you're just a part of the billion dollar industry of weight loss in America right now. During the pandemic, you know, they had TikTok and their feed was all about, oh, like ways to uh, uh, get rid of like belly fat, uh, you know, make, you know, your lower, your lower body more, you know, thicker. And it's like, um, I kind of just, you know, went through that. Fat. Genes and environment play important roles in the development of eating disorders. Families are not to blame and can be the patient's and provider's best allies in the treatment. I have a daughter who's 11. And, and I know that when she watches YouTube and when she sees, you know, certain women um, like the Kardashians or, you know, who are these sex symbols, if you will, um, for the majority of men, you know? And she's like, oh, like, does that, is that what it means to be sexy? Do I need to, to do this, you know? And like, oh, I wanna get my waist smaller. And so these girls are like squeezing their poor organs to, you know, to train their waist, to look like an image that they see on TV. And what's really crazy is that 
no matter how much waist training I do, I'll never look like that because I have ribs. And a lot of those girls have had surgery to remove their ribs so that their waists look like that. And that's not what's publicized. But these women go above and beyond because they know that sex sells and because they know that these companies and these endorsements are making money off of their appearance. Since the age of seven, I've always been getting fat shamed. I was always overweight and wanted to be as skinny as the other kids were, but I had no plan of what to do. I remember my eating was horrible. I always ate everything on site. I loved eating unhealthy. I wasn't very active. I would always sit by the computer, stay home, watch TV, or play video games. Through watching a lot of videos, I stumbled upon a thing called a calorie deficit. I didn't have a calorie counter or anything. I just calculated what I ate on a calculator and put in how many calories I thought it was. But the food choices I made were still poor. No quality food, nothing. At first, I was losing pounds like nothing until my friends and my family started to notice how little I was eating. They were worried. I had no energy. I was depressed, sick all the time. My breakfast was just protein bars at most. I quickly disliked eating. I started to binge on food. I hated myself, just so I could see those abs quicker. I did a lot of excess exercise. I remember doing 500 push-ups a day for three months. I wanted to skip trips, holidays, just so I could focus on this cut. I got ashamed of my body. I had severe body dysmorphia. My parents caught up to me and got me to the doctors where I was diagnosed with anorexia nervosa. The biggest issue in the medical community, which is, you know, frankly, who we're relying on to diagnose, treat these types of illnesses, we have this devilish BMI scale, which was indeed um, created by someone who was not a medical professional. This person was a mathematician. He was a white male. And the BMI scale, even that we use to this day, was based on a white European male. So <clears throat> when you have a healthcare system that is already biased, and then you have the, the thing that you use for data to get your information from was not even made for any of us on this call. It's, it's gonna happen. Fact. Eating disorders are complex medical and psychiatric illnesses. They are biopsychosocial diseases, which means that genetic, biological, environmental, and social elements all play a role. Fact, eating disorders affect people of all genders, ages, races, ethnicities, body shapes, and weights, sexual orientations, and social economic statuses. I, it's not just white no. cis women. And um, I think that's also something that is not really known, although it can take its path in very different ways in different people. Um, and a lot of it is not really about how you look. It's, it's the manifestation or the coping mechanism that's being used to deal with other stuff. The picture that I had in my mind was this emaciated, stick thin white woman. That's what I thought 
an eating disorder was. That's what I thought it looked like. I actually thought that I didn't even know that there was anything other than anorexia. people of color with self-acknowledged eating and weight concerns were significantly less likely than white participants to have been asked by a doctor about eating disorder symptoms, despite similar rates of eating disorder symptoms across ethnic groups. They, they look at a person externally and they try to associate an eating disorder that way. So when you look at us, nine times out of 10, our body weight because of the way that we are made. It's just in our genetic DNA, our composition. Like we're, we, we don't look like that. We, we just look different. And I think that um, that's why we get excluded. I also was like speaking towards my mother more. Like we didn't really have that, you know, friendship. And I think that built more of my mental health because Mm, my relationship with her wasn't really that good so when I started talking more to her it just like it improved my mental health a lot because you know having that someone you could like rely and talk to like could you know better your mental health people don't always listen to advice but I would just say be there for them and be a shoulder to cry on and an ear that can listen you'll get through it um, today's today but tomorrow's another day and well there's nothing to do but to get through it. Just face it and hopefully the next day will be a better day. Depression is an issue that I, I encounter a lot in the population of clients that I work with. And sometimes that looks like waking up in the morning or taking a shower um, or eating breakfast, you know, and, and it's asking for help when you're ready. When you're in recovery or when you desire to recover, it is gonna terrify you, but you have to be scared and do it anyway, because you know that that is what you need to do in order to be completely healthy. Not just physically healthy, but also emotionally healthy, mentally healthy.
is Valentina and I go to Satellite Academy High School. And I'm passionate about mental health and eating disorders because when I had gone through it personally, I wish it was more normalized and more talked about so that I could have reached out to somebody and, you know, gotten help in a much healthier way. Youth rising no matter what. Hello, my name is Dalian Peralta. I go to a school for excellence and innovation. I am passionate about mental health. You rising no matter what. My name is Christopher. I go to the high school is for excellent innovation. I am passionate about the problem in the in the world because if the interesting youth rising no matter what. My name is Karen. I go to Amalasaros High School. I'm passionate about eating disorders stories because it's important to me and nobody talks about it. Yo rising no matter what. Hello, my name is Hisana Bueno. I got to go Elish. I am a passionate about helping people feel better because I know how difficult it is to feel bad and no be able to express myself. You're rising no matter what. Hi, my name is Dylan Richard and I go to Eastside Community High School. I'm really passionate about surfing and rock climbing, a youth rising no matter what.